The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. American men and women who are devoting their lives to giving our youth the knowledge that is their heritage, we proudly dedicate this performance of The Cavalcade of America. On this program, the Cavalcade of America honors a living person, a woman whose work has earned her an undisputed place in the history of our time. She is Martha Berry, founder of Berry College in Georgia. The story of her life has been especially dramatized by Margaret Leworth for the Cavalcade of America in a radio play, Light in the Hills, and will be enacted by the Cavalcade players, starring Agnes Moorhead as Martha Berry. The Cavalcade Orchestra and the original musical score are under the direction of Don Voorhees. DuPont, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Light in the Hills as our drama on the Cavalcade of America. It is Georgia in the year 1890. In a crude log cabin that had once served as a plantation schoolhouse, a young woman sits at a wheezy harmonium, and at the cabin door, two mountain boys stand listening. My goodness, how long have you two been standing there? We was just listening, ma'am. It's right pretty, ma'am. Well, come on in. There are chairs here just about your size. You live here, ma'am? Oh, no, no. I live up on the hill. This little log cabin used to be our schoolhouse, but nobody uses it now. Come in. Come on in. Don't be bashful. You ain't a feared Floyd? Oh, of course he isn't. Tell me, what's your name? Floyd Luke. And this is Sandy. He's my brother. Luke? Yes, am Hmm, that's a fine name. A very wonderful man had that name once. Reckon we ain't here to tell of him. He's in the Bible. We ain't got a Bible home, ma'am. Reckon we ain't never read it, though. Oh, my goodness, that's too bad. The Bible has the most wonderful stories in the world in it. Now, look here. I have some cookies in this jar. Have some. Take a lot of cookies. Go on. That's fine. Now, you sit down and eat them, and while you're eating, I'll tell you a story out of the Bible. It ain't running. Oh, no, indeed. It's a real story right out of the Bible. It's about a man who went into a lion's den. We ain't never heard of that. The man's name was Daniel, and Daniel was a good man. And you know what? What? One day, some wicked men came and took Daniel and threw him into a lion's den. Hungry lions? Very hungry lions. And Daniel stayed there all night, but the lions didn't eat Daniel. He doesn't turn bad like Peppy's hope fat? (laughs) No, not quite, Sandy. No, it was because Daniel had faith that God would take care of him just as he takes care of you when you go through the hills. Yes, ma'am. And God did take care of Daniel, just as he looks after the whole world. Floyd, do you know how the world began? Reckon it just started up. No. God made the world. God? Mm Mm-hmm. First he made the land, then the water, then the sun and moon, and then all of us. Floyd and and me, too? Floyd and you and me and all of us, Sandy. Oh. Mm. Wouldn't you like to hear it in the Bible? Reckon that'd be right nice, ma'am. Well, I'll read it to you. It's the very first story in the Bible. Now, you listen carefully, and afterwards I'll tell you just what it means. Yes, ma'am. In the beginning... In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. Father, are you busy? Well, no, 
Hello, Martha. Come right in. I must talk with you, Father. There's something on my mind. I I don't know where to turn. Well, my dear child... I meant to tell you before, but somewhere or other, I've been so busy with my plans. Plans, Martha? What plans? Well, I'm going to open a school. School teaching is for spinsters, Martha. The war left plenty of those in my generation. I don't mean just another academy for young ladies, Father. I mean a school for the sons of these hill people. People who never had a chance to go to school. Mm -hmm. Who's going to support these boys while they're away at school? They'll support themselves. On the land you deeded to me across the road. We'll start with the log cabin and build. Boys can earn their keep right there on that land. Now, wait a minute, Martha. Now, stop and think. Now, even if it works, will it be worth it? Now, those people are the product of generations of poverty and despair. Now, you think a few years of learning can change that? I believe it can. Well, Martha, this is too much, the, the work involved. You won't be able to keep it up year after year. You haven't the right to rouse these people's hopes, because sooner or later you'll have to disappoint them. One woman against their problem just isn't enough. Father, I believe in this. I have to do it. And once I've started, I'll never turn back. I promise. Come in, Judge Wright. I'm mighty glad to see you. I brought the charter you wanted, Martha. You did? And some advice, which you may not want. Oh, well, let me have the charter first, Judge. Oh, my goodness, look at it. Berry School, it's the real thing. And so are some other things, my dear. Martha, taking these poor boys to board is going to be very expensive. You simply haven't the cash to go on with it. If your father was still alive, he'd tell you the same thing. I appreciate your interest, Judge Wright. But the Berry School has started and nothing can stop it. That's final. Martha, how do you know these boys will even want to come to your school? Because I know those people. And I'm going to choose the students myself. Every one of them. What you want? I, uh, I just want to talk to you. Is that your son out in the field? Yes, that's my young'un. He's a mighty fine-looking boy. You a revenuer? Looking for moonshine? Oh, goodness, no. Goodness, no. Uh, isn't that gun sort of heavy to hold like that? No. Tink. Oh, I see. Well, um, my name's Martha Berry. I live over Oak Hill. I'm starting a school. It's going to be the most wonderful school in the world, and I want your boy to come to it. School, eh? Reckon he don't need no learning. We need him to work here. But I won't keep him all the time. He'll come and live and study at my school part of the year and, and then come back to you. We're poor folks, ma'am. We ain't got no money to give our children school. But at my school, you... Hmm? Being, we might ask the lady in. She don't mean no harm. Ma'am, you the Sunday lady they's talking about? Teaching Bible at Possum Trust? Yes, I am. And you want to teach our boy to read? Yes, and write, and do sums, and, and learn to farm. But you... Teach him to read. So maybe he could read out of the Bible to us. That's what I want to do. Jaffrey. Mm? We're going to let David go. Well... No. Now, don't make no matter. We'll just get along best we can without him. If he's going where he can learn to read the Bible. How much it's going to cost, ma'am? It's not going to cost anything. David can work out his keep when he gets there, building and farming and helping around. Did you hear that, Jaffrey? I heard it. And I say the boy's going to work here. We ain't taking nothing from nobody. It ain't taking. David will be working. Ma'am, our boy will come to your school. 
Just as soon as we can get him some overalls and shoes. It'll just mean selling a little more moonshine. That's all. Martha, with all this rain, the bridge may be washed out. Maybe the children won't even be able to get here today. Elizabeth, those boys said they'd be here for the opening of the school today. They'll get here somehow. I don't know. Sometimes I'm not so sure. What are you thinking? Honestly, I mean. Right now? Right now. I was thinking about violets. Violets? Well, why not? We could plant violets along all the paths leading to the school. And... Look, my dear, why don't you go and get some rest? I don't mind waiting alone. Well, if you're sure, I think I will. I'll bring some tea over from the... What was that? Well, it sounds like a pig. Oh, nonsense. Pigs don't knock at doors. I'll open it. Oh, my goodness. Come on in. Uh, you Miss Berry? Yes, I am. Well, I'm David. Well, come on in, David. Welcome to Berry School. Thank you, ma'am. Um, this pig here is to pay my way. I've come to get my learning. Well, well, well. Good evening, Martha. Oh, Judge Wright, I'm so glad you've come over. Five of the boys are being promoted tomorrow. Think of it. And we have a mule and 30 chickens and 10 acres of cotton. Well, that's wonderful. But I'm afraid I'm father gloom today. Your bank balance has just touched zero. Oh, I don't even want to think of bank balances. I'm so happy. Martha, you have to think about it. Right now. You're broke. Absolutely. Now you hush up and come with me, Judge Wright. I have a job of work for you, too. Well, I give up. Miss Barry! What? Miss Barry, come quick. There's smoke coming out of the ceiling and sparks. Oh, my goodness. Look at the Real ceiling, fire. Judge. The chimney is red hot. You get out of here right away, you two. Take the boys with you. I'll yeah. send Thomas for the fire brigade. Tell them to come quick. Boys! Boys, order! Order! Now line up! Line up, all of you. I guess we saved the kitchen in the back room. See, Miss Barry, the boys are pretty wet. Some of them shivering. Get them all into the kitchen, David. Yes, sir. And get all the blankets from Mammy. She's gone. Yes, sir. Martha, Barry. you're wet and exhausted. Let me take you over to the house and send Mammy back here. You need something hot. No, Judge, I won't leave now. I've got to figure out some way of rebuilding the school. I'm afraid that's impossible, Martha. No, it's not. I can go north and, and find help. Who in the world do you know up north? Nobody. But that doesn't matter. If it will save the school, I'll become a beggar. Oh, yes. Uh, come in, Miss Berry. Sit down. Thank you. I'm glad to see you, of course, at the request of uh, Reverend Daniels. Thank you. But I must warn you, I have only about five minutes. Well, I'll only take a few minutes, Mr. Williams. I have a school in Georgia. It's really a wonderful school for poor boys who have no place else to go. Yes, uh, yes. Mr. Williams, some of those boys haven't even shoes. None of them can read. Yes, uh, yes, Miss Berry. Uh, what is it uh, about the school? Well, you see, we, we need money to... Money? Oh, why didn't you say that, uh... You want a contribution, I suppose? Well, I guess you'd call it that. But these boys, Mr. Williams... I'd like to be able to help you, of course. But frankly, I, I have a great many demands. And, well, all my charities have been taken care of this year. Furthermore, a, a school in Georgia seems... Uh, well, it seems a little remote. It's part of this country. It's a fine part, Mr. Williams, and the people there... Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure of that. I'm sure. And we're only asking for a little here and there. Well, I'll tell you. My lists are all made out this year, but... Uh, if a dollar will help you, here it is. It's been a pleasure to meet you, Miss Berry, and now... Yes. Yes, of course. 
Thank you, Mr. Williams. Thank you. I'm sorry, Miss Barry. Mr. Tompkins is in conference. But this is the third time you've told me that. Please. Did you give Mr. Merrill my message? Uh, Miss Barry, quite frankly, Mr. Merrill's very busy and can't see you. Uh, however, he authorizes me to give you this check for $5. I think it's marvelous, the work you're doing. Simply marvelous. The whole club thinks so. Well, it's certainly wonderful to find someone sympathetic after all these months. <laughs> Do you want to give me a check now, or shall check? I... Check? Well, I'm afraid the club's finances wouldn't permit a check at this time. Look where you're going, lady. You get run over in the street like that. Uh, here, miss. Better hang on to your umbrella in this wind. Oh, thank you. I... Look here, I'm awfully sorry, but I believe I'm going to... Hey. Hey. Hey, somebody. Quick, somebody get help. We're mighty glad to have you with us again, Miss Barry. Thank you, David. My, it's good to be back at this school. <laughs> uh, there's a man outside to see you, Miss Barry. What shall I tell him? Let him come in, Robbie. You sure you feel well enough? Of course, Robbie. Go along. You can come back later, David. Yes, Miss Barry. Uh, Miss Barry? Yes, yes, come in. Uh, will you sit down? Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, I'll come to the point, Miss Barry. I, I'm a banker. My name's Clark. Uh, Miss Barry, tell me, what do you yourself get out of Barry School? In money? Nothing. Mm, I, I thought so. Miss Barry, I've been watching your school closely. I'm proud to know that, Mr. Clark. Yes, I know how you go into the hills and handpick your students. It's the only way to get the most deserving. Those boys have no idea how lucky they are. Miss Barry, you need money, don't you? Desperately. Right now, I don't know how we can pay our teachers the rest of this year. I see. <clears throat> Miss Barry, I want you to take my son here at Barry School. Your son? Yes, and I'm prepared to pay you to take him. Mr. Clark, Barry School was founded only for poor boys who work for their tuition. Well, that work is what I want for my son. I believe you can help make a man of him. Well, I'm deeply honored, Mr. Clark, but it's impossible. Oh, I, I admire your motives. But I'm asking you to make an exception in this case. I'm prepared to pay Barry School $25,000 to take my son. Mr. Clark. That's right. $25,000. I write the check now. You don't know what it means to refuse that offer. What? Well, surely you're not going to. Uh, there isn't a school in the country that would refuse my son. Mr. Clark, Barry is only for boys who have no other chance. If I make an exception of your son, there'll be others. And someday, Barry will no longer be for the poor boys of the South. No, Mr. Clark, Barry must be the kind of school we planned or we shall have failed. And $25,000 doesn't interest you? $25,000 means everything to me, Mr. Clark. But we must manage somehow without it. Miss Barry, ma'am, I reckon we can't take you to the station. The wheel come off the wagon, and I can't fix it no more. Axles walk clean through. Well, saddle the mule, Robbie. I'll ride him to the station. Uh, but, Miss Barry, wh what are we going to do while you're gone to Washington? We can't get in our crop without a wagon. Well, maybe if I get to see the president, we'll get a brand new wagon. Gee, Teddy Roosevelt. You really going to ask him to give us a new wagon? Well, maybe not exactly. Well, you ask him. Folks always do what you ask them, Miss Barry. <laughs> I don't know. What's this picture here, Miss Betty? That's the brick kiln, Mr. President. Boys make their own bricks. This picture's the first wall they ever built. <laughs> it isn't very straight. Pretty good. What's this picture? Cotton? Yes. Three bales. That was a bumper year. Farmers, too? Mm. 
Turning out jacks of all trades down there, aren't you? Yes, every boy has a chance of 25 trades to learn, as well as the academic courses. Bully idea. How many boys do you have? 300, and another 300 waiting to come. Mm hmm. Any girls? No, not yet. But we must have a girls' school, Mr. President. The boys who go out from Barrie to make their homes and build up the South must marry girls who are equal to them. Come. Yes, what is it? Mr. President, the three senators are still waiting. Tell them to wait some more. Yes, Miss Berry, you must have a girl's school. As President of the United States, I can't do anything personally. But if you'll come to dinner at the White House Thursday, I'll see that you meet men who will be able to help you. Oh, Mr. President, thank you. Young woman, you're doing the finest citizenship job in this country. When I get rid of this job of president, I'm coming to your schoolhouse and pay you a good long call. Berry School grew. It grew until it had the largest campus of any school in the world and the longest waiting list. And suddenly, in the midst of her work, Martha Berry found honors heaped upon her. In 1925, another president summoned her to the White House. He was Calvin Coolidge. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure tonight to present this medal for distinguished service to one who, seeing a great need, turned from the pleasant places to bring light and opportunity to children, Miss Martha Berry. <laughs> Miss Berry, because of you, thousands have been released from the bondage of ignorance, and countless other thousands in the generations to come will walk not in darkness, but in light. You have built by faith. Faith in your vision, faith in God. This medal will be a testimonial to you that your fellow Americans are proud of you and wish you well in your labors. <laughs> Mr. President, I accept this medal humbly for myself, but proudly for my boys and girls. My life ambition has been to free the children of the mountain forest, to give them to America strong of heart, of mind, and of soul. This has been my hope, my dream, and my prayer. And I promise you, very school will go on. It will go on in the words of an old woman of the hills who stopped me once when I was leaving her cabin. She said, what's the hurry, Miss Martha? What's the matter with tomorrow? Why, tomorrow ain't been touched yet. <laughs> Martha Berry has touched tomorrow, the tomorrow of the South and of all America. And as she listens to this program, surrounded by her students at Mount Berry, on the largest campus in the world, she is secure in the faith she has given her own land. It is her courageous wisdom shared with all of us that brings this tribute from the cavalcade of America. <laughs> to Agnes Moorhead and to the Cavalcade players for their performance of Light in the Hills. And now the DuPont Company brings you its story from the wonder world of chemistry. No one can foretell the future, but man's hopes and aspirations point to what may come. In the dreams of the chemist are a clue to the shape of the world that will be. He sees chemistry working in all the fields of man's daily life, in food, in clothing, in shelter, in transportation, in health and enjoyment. 
The chemist sees the green fields heavy with crops, crops growing in soil rich with nitrogen that he has made from the air, yielding not alone food, but stuffs to be turned into the thousand and one Cinderella materials of the richer life. There will be food in abundance that we may draw vitality from it to build our new world. On a hundred million acres, we will do away with the threat of insects, of crop diseases. We will have harvests unblemished and in full measure. The chemist has done many wonderful things with man-made fibers. He has made them stronger than drawn steel, finer than a spider's thread. And further exploration of the buried wealth of the sun's unstinted giving is bound to yield us more and more. Disease and sickness must someday surrender to the advances of chemistry. The chemist will find untold new compounds. And where there now is dread, we shall have abiding hope and health. And transportation. Our ever-widening horizons will be pushed back still further by chemistry, widening the amphitheater in which we live. Gone even today is the single valley of our fathers, and as the men of science develop fuels and methods of transport that make us move faster, farther, and safer, we shall truly become citizens not alone of the Americas, but of the world. In our homes, we will make our own weather, mild in the yellow blaze of summer, mild in the white cold of winter, with even heat and clean, sterile air. Finally, we may hope that in the years to come, men of science will see their greatest dream come true. Their wish that their way of solving problems may become common practice for all. That in dealing with the problems men must meet, our suspicion and violence will give way to calmness and clear thinking. This, in the final analysis, may be the greatest gift the men of science have in store for tomorrow a majestic, ever-expanding way of life, resting upon a foundation of truth. When, if we men lend our wills to it, tomorrow. So say the scientists who bring you better things for better living through chemistry. Now, Ted Jewett of the Cavalcade Players to tell you about next week's program. Ladies and gentlemen, next week, the Cavalcade of America will present one of the outstanding radio personalities of our time, Alexander Wolcott. As part of our continued effort to bring to the air original treatments of important American subjects by distinguished American authors, Mr. Wolcott, in collaboration with the brilliant American composer and commentator Deems Taylor, has prepared for Cavalcade a unique impression of a great moment in our history when a beloved American song was born in the dark of a troubled night, nearly 80 years ago. DuPont presents, as the special guest of next week's program, the town crier, Alexander Wolcott. Thank you. Among the cavalcade players on this program, in support of Agnes Moorhead, who played the part of Martha Berry, Thomas Berry was Carl Swenson, Judge Wright, John McIntyre. Mountain Woman was Jeanette Nolan, David Kingsley Colton, Theodore Roosevelt, Ray Collins, and Mr. Williams was Edwin Jerome. Your announcer is Clayton Collier, sending best wishes from DuPont. This is the National Broadcasting Company.